You're listening to Ask the Expert on Sprott Money News. Well, greetings once again from Sprott Money News and SprottMoney.com. It is the month of September 2019, and this is your Ask the Expert segment. I'm your host, Craig Hemke, and joining us this month is best-selling author and analyst Jim Rickards. Many of you are familiar with Jim. You must be because we've got a whole bunch of questions for Jim. Uh, His latest book, Aftermath, uh, is a bestseller both in the Wall Street Journal and internationally, and we certainly encourage you to pick up not only Aftermath, but all of the books that Jim has written as he's very insightful and uh, much of what he discusses is already playing out. Jim, it's really an honor to get a chance to visit with you again. Thanks for spending some time with us here at Sprott Money News. Thank you, Craig. It's great to be with you. And before we get started, just to remind everybody, it is September. What September means is that Eric's pick of the month at Sprott Money is the Royal Canadian Mint Gold Maple Coin. Those things are real beauties. If you've ever purchased one, now's the best time. They are beautiful coins. They are, we can get them at Sprott Money now for just $36.99 over spot. You can, of course, call us at 888-861-0775 or just go to SprottMoney.com. You'll find those gold maples there as well as all other whole bunch of other great deals on gold and silver bullion. Uh, Jim, like I said, you're a very popular guy. I've got a, a list of questions here. We'll try to move through them as efficiently as possible. But if you are ready to roll, we'll start with question number one. Good to go, Craig. All right, let's do it. Uh, hey, I think this is a fun question to get started with, uh, especially since Brought Money is based in Canada and we have a lot of Canadian listeners. Uh, you, as you know, the U.S. states that it has over 8,000 metric tons of gold. However, Canada now does has a whopping total of zero ounces officially. Where do you think this leaves Canada going forward? Well, uh, it kind of leave, leaves uh, Canada with a seat at the uh, against the wall instead of at the table. And what I mean by that is uh, we're getting closer and closer. And I'm not saying tomorrow or next month or um, you know, in the, even in the next six months, but we are getting closer to some kind of international monetary conference, something like a Bretton Woods or maybe the Plaza Accord from uh, 1985. Uh, and I talk about this in my book, Aftermath, Chapter 6, uh, I actually call it the Mar-a-Lago Accord. Uh, really just, you know, it's a vehicle just picking out Mar-a-Lago as a place where uh, some convening power, in that case, President Trump, might call an international monetary conference. But, of course, it doesn't have to be there. It could be anywhere. But but the point being, I've spoken to some of the leading um, financial, not just experts, but uh, policymakers in the world, um, have one-on-one conversations with uh, Ben Bernanke, of course, former chairman of the Fed, John Lipsky, former uh, head of the IMF, um, and others, and they all say the same thing. They say the international monetary system is incoherent. That's, that's their word, not my word. I heard it separately from Bernanke and Lipsky and heard uh, similar comments. And we're starting to see um, proposals not coming from the fringes or you know, deep in the, in the uh, base of some research institute, but from the leading, again, the leading monetary policymakers, Mark Carney, uh, is the only person I can think of who was the head of two central banks. He was the head of the Central Bank of Canada and the Central Bank, or the uh, Bank of England, which, of course, is the Central Bank of the UK. Um, and he released a paper on Bank of England letterhead at the Jackson Hole conference uh, last month calling for a new international monetary system. His idea was uh, a kind of a digital SDR, that's the special drawing right. There are other proposals out there, John Taylor, uh, Stanford University, again, leading monetary economist, has a new proposal. So all these things are, are straws in the wind, so to speak, but they're all pointing towards a new international monetary conference. And what comes out of it, who knows whether it's um, a gold standard or a commodity standard or a, a fiat, but it's the SDR instead of the dollar. Those are all things that be on the, that will be on the table. But But here's what I know. When the the participants are selected, and Canada will certainly be among them because it's a G7 economy, and it's, you know, it's practically the, the you know, largest trading partner of the United States, Canada will be in the room. But think of it as a poker game. You want to sit down with a big pile of chips. So who has, what are the chips? The chips are gold. The U.S. has 8,000 times, you know, or more actually. Germany has over 3,000 times. Um, uh, Russia is now well over 2,000 times. China is well over 2,000 tons. 
Uh, China and Russia, by the way, have, have increased their gold reserves by a factor of three or higher in the last 10 years. So if you have gold, you're going to get a seat at the table. And if you don't have gold, you're going to be, you know, in a seat at, back against the wall watching, uh, watching the action. So that, that'll be Canada again. A great country, important economy. But if you don't have gold, you're not going to be one of the uh, decisive voices at this conference I'm describing. Right. Who, he who owns the gold makes the rules, basically. Um, basically. Uh, Jim, question two is kind of along those lines. It, it, here in the 21st century, is the concept of having a global reserve currency actually becoming obsolete? Uh, no, because we have an international um, monetary system. Now, if you had a single global currency, if you said there's one and only one global reserve currency, and then what would you have to, it kind of begs the question, what would it be? Uh, it's sort of the fact of the dollar, but even the dollar has to share uh, the space in countries' reserve accounts. Uh, maybe we should just explain for listeners what um, you know what a reserve account is. Uh, you know, if you make uh, let's say fifty thousand dollars and you've got forty thousand dollars of you know living expenses and taxes, and you've got ten thousand dollars left over, uh, and you put that into savings or some investment, that's your reserve. It's just the excess of what you made over what you spent. Uh, well, countries are the same way. They export and they earn hard currency, and then they import and they have to use the hard currency to pay for the imports. And if you have more exports than imports, you you have some savings as a country, and those are added to your reserve. So your reserve is just the you know the cumulative uh, trade surplus or capital account surplus, if you want to think of it that way. Now that that begs the question: Well, what do I invest it in? You can't just have a pile of, you know, dollar bills on pallets in the basement of your central bank. Um, and so you go out and buy government bonds or um, some countries uh, have stocks. I mean, the Bank of Japan is, I think, owns a, a big chunk of the Japanese stock market. But the point is you have to choose among currencies uh, in which these um, instruments are denominated. The dollar to the U.S. dollar makes up about 60% of global reserves. Uh, it makes up about uh, 80% of global payments and almost 100% of uh, energy payments, oil and natural gas. So uh, it's clearly the dominant reserve currency, but you know other currencies have a share, primarily the euro. Um, Canadian dollar, Australian dollar have small slices, and uh, you know the Japanese yen, uh, pound sterling, Swiss francs, and uh, Chinese yuan. Again, China has a very small slice of that pie, but it's 60% U.S. dollars. Well, if you want to redesign the international monetary system and pick a new global reserve currency, everyone hates the dollar as it is. You know, China, Russia, Iran, anybody who's subject to U.S. sanctions, which we implement through dollar payments, uh, doesn't like the fact that the dollar is kind of has this hegemonic power, if you will, in the international monetary system. They would like to overthrow it. Uh, and that points in the direction of the special drawing right, the IMF, SDR. Well, if you're... Um, if you're going to have the kind of you know international monetary conference we described, and you want to elevate, uh, let's say, the SDR to that uh, role, I mean, obviously that's going to require um, you know a lot of negotiation and a lot of compromise. And I'm not sure why the U.S. would go along with it, but maybe in a uh, in, in a world where um, uh, there was a loss of confidence in the dollar or fiat currencies generally, that might there might not be much choice. But uh, at the end of the day, um, you're going to need some benchmark, some yardstick for uh, keeping score. And that's either going to be uh, something like a digital currency, a digital SDR that everyone agrees on, uh, in which case you might say, well, we don't need reserves anymore. We just, um, although, I, I mean, you sort of do. You have an SDR reserve, but as long as the IMF can print up SDRs and hand them out, you've got a, a new system where, accumulating dollars or, or for that matter, Canadian dollars or pound sterling doesn't matter as much because everything's based in these SDRs. But we're, we're a long way from that. I think the idea that um, there might be a crisis or there might be just um, a little forward thinking where we sit down and start this process, uh, that's very realistic, but uh, it's still a long way from there to, to a new global reserve currency. Got it. All right, question number three. Uh, obviously, we talk about gold a lot, and uh, and you often mention diversifying into gold uh, to help manage these risks going forward, but you rarely mention silver or the mining shares. Uh, why is that? 
Well, um, I guess I'm a uh, sort of an economist and a, and a monetary expert. That I, that goes back a long way. Uh, my my career back to the 70s. I, I didn't go to mining school. Uh, I like mining, by the way. I, I visit a lot of mines. I've been down underground in uh, South Africa and Australia and, and a few other places. So uh, I'm, I'm a fan of, of the mining sector, but I don't hold myself out as a as a geologist. But just briefly, I, w- I would say two things. Number one, uh, mining stocks are a leverage bet on gold. So if you like gold, then by all means, have some in your portfolio. I certainly recommend it. I recommend a 10% allocation to gold. But if you have a little more appetite for risk, and you say, well, yeah, I like gold. I think it's going up, but can I do better? Well, the answer is um, you have two choices. You can use gold futures, uh, which are leveraged contracts, or you can buy gold mining shares, which are leveraged in a different way, having to do with um, how markets value stocks and the difference between fixed costs and variable costs. But you know, when you buy a gold mining stock, you're not just um, betting on gold, you're betting on the ability of management to um, uh, you know, reduce costs or run that very efficiently or get their own kind of leverage inside the company which you own. Um, so it, it's you know you need a little more risk appetite, but the, re- the rewards are there also. Uh, I always say when when looking at gold mining stocks, you know geology is geology, a feasibility study is a feasibility study, uh, you know finance is finance. All those things are sort of the same. Uh, what differentiates gold miners is management. Uh, so um, I'm not you know, recommending any particular stocks. I don't uh, I think I'm expert in that, but I do know that in looking at gold mining shares, you want to uh, you want to kind of bet on management, look for the person with a track record, uh, the person who knows how to um, you know build up a company and then possibly sell. When you look at the big guys, and I'm talking about Barrick and and others. Um, they're having a very tough time on the discovery front. Their new gold discoveries are, it's very difficult. It's difficult for everybody, but just because you're a big mining company doesn't make it any easier or much easier. But they grow by acquisitions. So, um, so the, the bet would be pick a well managed, uh, well capitalized, but still junior gold miner, uh, ride that, you know, horse, so to speak. And then, uh, your payoff uh, could be a higher stock valuation, but it could also be, somebody like that are coming along and just buying them at some uh, substantial multiple, and that's another way to make money. As far as silver is concerned, um, look, silver is a precious metal. Uh, silver is a little more difficult to analyze because it's not just a precious metal. It's also an industrial input, uh, a commodity, in other words. Uh, and the thing with gold is it, gold's not good for anything except money. Uh, gold is the best form of money, and that's why investors should have gold in their portfolios. But um, it's not good for much else. Uh, people say jewelry, yeah, but jewelry is just wearable wealth. I mean, jewelry is it's a way to hold your gold because you can put it around your neck or put it on a wear a bracelet or a, a, a ring or whatever. But it's it's still gold. That's why people buy it. But silver is uh, an important industrial input. It's used in a lot of applications, uh, automobiles, electronics, etc. So you're subject to business cycle risk in addition to what everything's going on with the monetary system. Having said that, uh, you know, you're not going to see gold go to, you know, pick a number of $5,000 an ounce without silver going to $100 an ounce. In other words, silver is always going to tag along. It has its own dynamics. But, um, and everyone should have some silver. I recommend um, in the United States we have what's called a monster box. Uh, they come straight from the U.S. Mint. They're... They're in a nice, you know, hard shell treasury green box with compression straps. Uh, and inside are a um, thousand, uh, I'm sorry, 500 uh, American silver eagles. So one ounce of pure silver, four nines, uh, made by the U.S. Mint. It's beautiful coin, beautiful design. Uh, but as I say, you've got uh, 500 uh, one ounce silver coins. Everyone should have one of those. They, they, well, they run around. Ten thousand dollars, maybe a little, little bit more at today's market. But you know, people will say, "Well, I'm prepared for a hurricane. I've got a flashlight, and extra batteries, and water, and plywood. That's good." Have a monster box too, because if the power grid goes down, people forget. Well, gas pumps don't work, ATMs don't work, banks are closed, um, you know, credit cards don't work, etc. Uh, and then in a more extreme kind of stressful situation, you'll find that the, the silver is money good. You can go out and buy groceries for your family or or um, or gas for your car if it's uh, if it's somehow available. So, yep. uh, so I do I do recommend everyone have a monster box. 
Gotcha. Okay, question number four. We just, uh, earlier this week, we heard from Chairman Powell in the uh, FOMC. You know, there were some questions yesterday, that day about uh, negative interest rates. The world seems headed directly toward lower and lower and even negative interest rates. Do you think that trend will ever reverse? Uh, the, the world is headed to lower interest rates. That is, uh, uh, I feel strongly about that. I think it's very good evidence for that. Whether you go to negative rates, that is a different question. So, of course, Europe, Japan, uh, Sweden, uh, other, Switzerland, others, they're all, they already have negative rates. So, uh, that, uh, you know, that cat's out of the bag, so to speak. The question, of course, is the United States. I recently attended, um, joined a, a conference at Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. Uh, we were commemorating the 75th anniversary of the original Bretton Woods conference, and we were there on the exact day. So the original Bretton Woods was uh, July 23rd, 1944. That's when they signed the agreement. Uh, we were there July 23rd, uh, 2019, again for the 75th uh, anniversary. And it was a pretty distinguished group. Uh, Larry Summers was there, former U.S. Secretary of the Treasury. Um, ben Steele, a head of international monetary uh, economics for the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, you know, as, as I say, you can mention a lot of others, but a uh, pretty, pretty high-level group talking about the future of the international monetary system. But one of our panels uh, involved, I, I can't mention the names because it was off the record, but three top central bankers, two from the Fed, uh, one from a regional reserve bank, one from the Board of Governors, and then a governor of the European Central Bank. So this, this was the real deal. These were real central bankers. And I was surprised at how relaxed they were about negative rates. Of course, the European representatives said, well, yeah, we're, we already have them, and we're going to go more, we're going to cut more, which they did um, on September 12th. But um, the U.S. bankers as well were, were sure, uh, you know, we got to get to zero first, and if you're doing 25 basis points per meeting and you keep up that tempo, uh, it's going to take eight meetings to get to zero. Uh, but at that point, both of the Fed representatives said, yeah, we've looked at it. Uh, we have an open mind. They, by the way, just to be clear, they didn't say they were going to do neg- to go negative, and they didn't say that any policy decision had been made. So I don't want to, you know, uh, overstate it. But they were. They said, yeah, that would be a logical thing to look at at the time. Now, Jay Powell uh, the other day said the opposite. He said, we're not thinking about it, and we're, you know, in fact, not going to go there. Uh, we'll see what happens. Um, see, see, Powell has a different agenda. Powell actually wants to raise rates, believe it or not. Now, he knows he can't. He knows that's bad for a weak economy, which we have. So I'm not saying Powell's going to raise rates. In fact, he's probably going to cut them some more. But he really doesn't want to. He wants to raise rates because he wants to get ready for the next recession. He wants you know, more more ammunition in the, uh, in the ammo box, if you will. But he can't do it. So... Powell is being dragged very, very reluctantly into rate cuts that he does not want to do, but he says we are data dependent and we want to accommodate, you know, what the economy needs and what the economy is screening for right now is lower rates. So I I believe the Fed uh, will cut rates again uh, before the end of the year. Whether that's once or twice is a little more of an open question, but I would say at least once, uh, even though Powell doesn't want to. So, so for a guy who wants to raise rates and is being reluctantly forced to cut them, uh, he certainly doesn't want to talk about negative rates because that, that suggests that we're going to zero by uh, this time next year. But uh, we may be at zero this time next year. Yeah. Jim, let's stick with Fed policy as we move to question five. Uh, why does the Fed target 2% inflation and is hyperinflation ultimately a possibility? Uh, they well, they say there's what they say and what they actually mean. So let's separate those. What they say is that um, we need two percent inflation so we can have kind of three percent or higher interest rates. So you get into something called the term premium. So every every lender, every investor who's getting you know a fixed income return wants to make at least the rate of inflation. If you don't make the rate of inflation, um, you know you're, you're obviously losing money. You're losing real value. So um, so they say, well, let's have inflation at 2%. And then, of course, investors want what's called a term premium. I don't just want to make inflation because that's kind of a break even. I, I want to make more. Now, the, the amount more that the market demands varies, but let's just say it's 
it's 2% more. So if you have inflation of 2% and a term premium of 2%, that means investors in, say, 10-year notes are going to get 4%, which, of course, they're not today. They're getting, they're getting about 1.7% and 1.8% yield to maturity. So why does the Fed want interest rates to be up around 4% based on a combination of 2% inflation and 2% term premium? The answer is that the research shows that that's how much you have to cut rates to get the U.S. out of a recession. Now, if the U.S. goes into a recession, how much does the Fed have to cut rates to get out of the recession? Well, the answer is 4 to 5 percentage points. Well, how do you cut 4% if you're at 2 well, the answer is you can't, uh, and, and right now we are at two, uh, we're a little bit lower, actually, 1.75. So the point being, the Fed wants some inflation and then put a term premium on top of it, get an interest rate structure that's 4% or higher so that they can cut them in the event of a recession. Now, that's what they say. Um, I, I disagree with all that. I just stated the case, but I don't agree with it. Uh, I, I think inflation should be zero. No, no inflation, no deflation. That should be the target. Uh, but it's not. Um, but what's the real reason? I said there was a real reason behind it. The real reason is that the debt situation is out of control. The U.S. debt to GDP ratio is the highest since the end of World War II. Uh, but two things. Number one, at least we won World War II uh, with our allies, so uh, we got something for the money. And two, the United States spent uh, the next uh, 35 years getting that ratio down from 120% to 30%. So both parties, Republican and Democrat, whether it was Dwight Eisenhower or Lyndon Johnson or you know Richard Nixon or Jimmy Carter, they, they shared the view that you had to get that number down, and they did. Uh, by 1980, the debt-to-GDP ratio was 30%, down from 120% at the end of World War II. Well, guess where it is today? It's 106%. Yeah. Uh, and it's gone up a lot. Most of that increase was under the... Uh, Obama administration, but uh, again, I would I would fault uh, George Bush, uh, George W. Bush just as much, and for that matter, Donald Trump has banked out a couple uh, trillion dollar deficits in a short period of time. So, um, so that debt to GDP uh, ratio is sky high. Well, how do you get out of that? How do you get that down to a, a, a sustainable level? Well, you could grow, but there's good research that says the debt itself is a headwind to growth. Um, and they're not going to cut entitlements. So there, there's some things you could do, but they're not going to do. The easiest way to do it is inflation. Uh, and that gets to the last part of your question, is hyperinflation a possibility? Well, if the Fed's targeting inflation, maybe even higher than they're willing to admit publicly, for the, the real purpose of reducing the real value of the debt, they think, you know, 3% for 20 years, that cuts the real value of the debt in half. Um, and, um, and, and that's kind of a slow way of doing it. The problem is if you start flirting with three, four percent inflation, uh, what is the risk that it runs out of control? You change expectations from no inflation to mild inflation to hyperinflation. The answer is that's a real risk. And we saw it in the, uh, in the, in the late 1970s. So, uh, there's not much inflation around today. I'm not sounding the inflation, uh, fire alarm, but it is a goal of the Fed. The, re, the, the stated reason is so they can cut rates in a recession. The real reason is to get the debt to GDP ratio under control. But the risk that they can't do it the way they want and it turns into something close to hyperinflation is very real. That's one more reason to own gold. In the second half of this interview, Jim addresses questions regarding timely topics such as the current global shortage of U.S. dollars how a cashless society might value physical gold and silver, and the conditions under which Jim might increase his gold allocation to more than 10%. So please be sure to check back and give a listen to part number two as soon as you can. In the meantime, we talk a lot about physical gold and silver ownership here at Sprott Money News. Of course, you're going to need a place to store that metal, so please do not forget that besides being a gold and silver bullion dealer, Sprott Money is also a terrific option for storing your physical precious metal. You can store your metals in any of our six global locations. Sign up for Sprott Money International Storage and receive exclusive deals from us as well. Call us anytime, 888-861-0775 or visit SprottMoney.com for more details.